Um, just waiting for a few more minutes for a few people to come in, and then we're going to get started very quickly. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I hope you're ready for a very exciting webinar. We have some activities as well. Um, so yeah, um, so just one more minute and we're going to get started very soon. Before we start, um, I would like to know um, where everyone is coming from, actually. Uh, I'm based in Vancouver. Um, so it is about eight o'clock in the morning for me. And uh, do we have any other audiences from other cities? And feel free to use the chat box um, for that. And uh, do we have anyone else from, for example, Europe or other cities in the States? We have someone from Germany, Bos Bosnia. Oh, wow, 5, 5 p.m. there. Um, oh, sorry, you're at the end of your workday. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the people from UK, Wisconsin, um, Augusta, Turkey. Wow. Um, predict oh, hi. Hi, sorry. I'm predicted BC. We're in the same province. <laughs> um, hi, Pascomia, Slovenia, New York. Excellent. We have a lot of people from everywhere. Jack, where are you coming from? <laughs> I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. So not far from uh, Elizabeth out in Augusta. So. Ah, and then uh, South Korea. Wow, very, very nice. Wow. Okay, very, very exciting. I'm very excited about this. Diversity. All right, I'm I'm going to get started um, because we have a lot to cover, as I mentioned. Um, good. So we are here for the webinar, Seven Steps to Manage Your Research Data Digitally. And today we're going to cover some really practical strategies on how you can get started. Now, if you already have a uh, data management infrastructure or you are already doing things digitally, this is also a great refresher for you to see if there are things that you can improve on for your own practice. I'm very excited because um, this is, you know, sounds like we have a great audience. We have some, you know, questions um, later on that we're going to do some activities with. So um, we're going to get started now. Today we have two speakers. Uh, you will have me. Hi, I'm Teresa and I'm the content specialist for Synode. I have about 15 years of experience working in uh, um, the uh, academia, most, mostly uh, uh, to support research uh, grant facilitation. Um, I also come with a research background in uh, experimental medicine. So I did bench uh, science for, for a short uh, period of time. And then uh, we also have Jack here. Jack, say hi. Hello, hi <laughs> Jack is the key accounts manager, and he has uh, uh, seven years of experience supporting um, researchers in academia when it comes to their research uh, needs and, and equipment or uh, software needs. So today we're going to present, we are also, I want to mention that today a lot of the content it will be based on our own experiences as well as uh, experience uh, with Sino as well as Sino's customer success team because they have worked with a lot of people uh, in the transition from paper to a digital format so we get a lot of advice from it as well as to the seven steps to get started. All right, some housekeeping items to start. Chat will be open for activities and discussions, but if you have any questions, please leave the questions in the Q&A box because we will go to the questions at the end of the webinar. I know that some of you submitted questions during registration. We will answer some of them in the presentation, actually. Um, but for the other question, it will be during the web, uh, Q and A session at the end of the webinar. Webinar recording and a, uh, a list of resources referred to during the webinar will be available after the event. Uh, just look out for it in an email that's coming to you uh, probably an hour after the event. Uh, recording will be available next week. We will have a very short post webinar survey at the end of the webinar. Please, please make sure to fill out the survey because it gives us a chance to learn how we do and also a chance for you to propose a topic you would like to see covered in the future. So please make sure to fill out the post webinar survey. Lastly, I want to promote our next webinar, uh, setting up a digital infrastructure to support regulatory compliance. There will be a link to register for this webinar in your uh, follow-up email as well, uh, where um, the head of R&D for Dynamic Code is going to share their first-hand experience navigating the IVDR uh, regulation in Europe, uh, as well as talk about how to, in general, setting up a digital infrastructure, um, which can be really challenging for companies that don't have an existing structure or have existing existing a, a financial support for that. Okay, that's enough. We're gonna now start with an activity. It's an activity I love to do. It's called waterfall. Uh, what's gonna happen is that next slide, there will be one question on the slide. 
what we're going to do is you are going to type your answer for the question in the chat box. But do not press enter or submit. You're just going to type the answer in the box. Make sure that it's set to uh, send a message to everyone in the group. Again, do not type enter. Just type your answer there, OK? We're going to give everyone a little bit of time to type your answer in. And once everyone has done that, we will all hit submit at the same time. And then we'll share, also share the summary of this um, with the attending in a follow-up email in one of the follow-up emails. So are we ready? We're good? Again, don't press enter. <laughs> All right, so we're good. So the question is, what is your goal for managing data digitally? Why do you want to do this? Why are you here at this webinar? Why, why do you want to do, you know, manage your data better? Uh, or why are you planning to do data management digitally? Now, I'm going to give everyone a little bit of time uh, to type your answer into the chat. Just again, don't press enter just yet. I'm going to do a countdown. We're going to do it together. Think about the reason why what's motivating you to come here or what's motivating you to you know, make a change or you know, do things a little differently. Um, why do you care about this? You know? So what is your goal for managing data digitally? Um, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. Um, this is when I wish I have like the Jeopardy music, you know, like a dun 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 dun. dun. All right, we are counting down. Okay, I'm gonna count down, and then we're gonna submit the answer together. Three, two, one, enter. Okay. All right, so we can see there are a lot of answers here. So we have. Streamline analysis, streamline storage, we have compliance, data management, we have product development, we have improved efficiency, we have facility sharing, we have keeping record permanently, um, easy to find and organize, improve efficiency, so there I see efficiency a lot, and then better ma project management. All right, so you can see we all have a little bit of a different reason for wanting to manage data. Um, you know, um, to pr practice, to find data, okay. Uh, we can see that we have all have a little bit of a different reason of how, you know, we want to improve data management, right? And I see a lot of things like efficiency, you know, improving management. Uh, so a lot of time also it could be funding requirement, it could be regulatory compliance. And you don't want to lose data when someone leaves the lab. And, and I, have, I have a story about this later on regarding paper notebook that I will mention. Um, also, you want to be able to find data faster, you know, like when you need it, when you need to publish a paper, when you need to apply for grant, when you need to share with collaborators, and that just to improve the process and make things a lot easier. So there's so many different reasons, but it's important to care and important to know why. Um, before we go into the steps, there's one more thing I also want to cover, which is FAIR. Now, I think FAIR is a term that's like a lot of people, I'm not gonna talk too, too much because about FAIR because it's probably like a whole webinar on its own. Um, I want to touch on that though, because it is very important. It's a very important context when it comes to digital data management. Um, it's also a term that you will see coming up over and over again in either regulatory requirement, in university data management guidelines or in funding requirements. And what it's referring to is to be able to, you know, uh, for digital data, you need to have, be able to find it, you need to be able to access it, you need to be able to interoperate it, and you need to be able to reuse it. Some key concepts that you should be able to find data, and we're not just talking about data, but also metadata, which is what we consider data around data. Okay, so you, it's like a description or if it's like, you know, providing the context for the data. So you need to be able to find metadata and data um, easy to find for both humans and computers. You need to know how the data can be accessed, right? Either, you know, this paper notebook is stored somewhere in a box within this storage facility, so and so, or this file is stored in this file folder within this computer hard drive in a storage facility or with me. And also how, what kind of authorization authentications are required. The data should be integrated, integrated with other data. And in some sense, in some ways, if you're doing com computer programming, it should be able to interoperate with other applications or workflow. Lastly, metadata and data should be well described so that they can be reused, right? If you cannot replicate it, if you cannot reuse it, or if you cannot you know, repurpose it in different settings, then that's a problem. 
So that's kind of like the general key concept when it comes to FAIR. Strongly encourage everyone to go check out this page on uh, the FAIR principles. It will be in the email that you will receive, so you will be able to access it. But this creates a very good context and background in why we're doing what we're doing next. So let's get started with seven steps to manage data digitally. I do want to put a quote, this, I want to put a comment here to keep in mind that we are not funding or regulatory agencies. So any regulatory or funding requirements, you still need to go to those agency requirements. Like we cannot really provide advice there, but we can help support some of the needs that I have, but make sure to look at the requirements through funding agency and requirement uh, regulatory agencies. Number one. Step one, you want to have a clear goal in mind. What is the goal for, what is your goal for managing research data digitally? This gives you something to work toward. It also prevents distraction and help you to prioritize, to know what's important and what's good to have, what's necessary, what's not really critical. But wait a second, because we just did that in our activity. So you already know that you have a very clear goal in your mind. You want to be more efficient. You want to be you know, following you know, uh, some requirements. You want to be compliant. You want to have a central data management uh, method. You want to have analytics available down the road. Uh, you want to help share. You have a goal already in mind, great. Now, if you can go one step further, let's be a bit more specific about the goal. Break down something that's, break down the goal to be a bit more measurable. Uh, for example, you can know whether you succeed, you succeed or not, right? And include a time frame. And this time frame can be something like when you need to provide a progress report, right? By this time, you need to be able to do this. Um, that's something that, that can help you to track your progress. If you uh, have a data management plan, if you set up a data management plan already, this is also where you can refer to, right? To see, you know, the break, uh, have a clear goal and the breakdown of the goal and, and some, you know, um, specifics. So next step would be that you want to be able to understand best practices. And this is why having FAIR in mind is very important because you'll see that a lot of these best practices have some sort of connection to FAIR. So for your files, for example, looking at naming convention, uh, conventions, right? Ensure it's, it's descriptive, ensure it's relevant, ensure it's easy to see and be like, this is the data I'm looking for. Incorporate dates, version, numbers, or project number in your naming um, of the files. You wanna keep it short. Um, you don't want to have it extended to a very, very long and you like cut off like half of the file name and not be able to refer to it later on. Uh, version control, you want to have some system in place for version control to track the different versions and activities, like who make what changes. It can be uh, a table at the beginning of the data to say, hey, I made this change, it is here. It could be some kind of digital method of automatically tracking um, this, uh, this information. Um, and then, um, so, so that's that. So there's also metadata, which is to make sure uh, to capture metadata. And this can have to include a title, a description, some sort of summary, um, you know, uh, on people, some the person who developed the file or the keywords. And then you need to be able to cross-reference and, you know, the doc and, and make sure you have the documentations together. So you make sure that you can trace from file to file. For example, my data, it comes from a protocol that was this file. It has inventory that's from that file. It has, you know, all those things, right? You want to be able to trace different components and make sure that you can locate supplementary information like reports, raw data. Sometimes you might have survey templates. You have other notes to go with it. Make sure you can locate it. Okay. Next. For your organizing the files, you want to create a hierarchy for your file folders. So start with a broader topic and then slowly narrowing down, right? And make sure to narrow down to the specifics. Also, you want to back up your files regularly. And, uh, um, and uh, that way, if you lose a file, then you can always go to the backup version. Now, this is something that's a lot easier to be done in digital format, right? This is not something that can be easily done in paper copies. You want to be consistent through your, you know, uh, throughout this whole thing. You want to develop a system. You want to revise during. You can revise during the transition, but you want to stick to the system as much as you can, and you want to record the system somehow so that everyone can do things consistently. 
and you want to share best practices with your whole lab. Make sure all team members, especially if you're collaborating a project, if you're sharing files, make sure all of them are aware of the best practices and follow them. What happens is that if you have two people in the lab doing the best practices and two people in the lab not doing the best practices, then you have a mix of naming conventions, you have a mix of how files are structured, it becomes really challenging to manage. So that's why you want to make sure that your whole lab or at least people you're working closely with are in on this. There are two references uh, that we will be providing in the email that you will get. Um, so uh, they, these two references are great uh, for kind of going through, following the steps and knowing what's important, uh, what's the best practices, and then um, the standards. Uh, the, the Harvard uh, one link has a very detailed guide where, and examples about naming conventions. All right, so next step would be that you're going to review how you're managing data right now because this will help you understand your exact existing data practices. There are some key questions to ask, right? What data are generated in what format? Because that can come uh, in play when it comes to storage, how, how you use to store it, how, what, you, what program you use to open your file. We talk about access, right? You need to be able to access the file. How are the data preserved and consolidated, right? How are they kept together? Is it in one file format? Is it in, in a storage uh, unit? Is it in one hard drive? Is it in the cloud? Who has access to them? Who need access to them, right? Who can find those files when, when necessary? What happens when you have collaborated? How are you sharing files? Is it going to be attachments or email? Or is it going to be a link? Um, can you share files easily? And how do you access data when you need them? Do you need to be there locally in person to flip those pages? Uh, or need to be locally use a computer lots log on in a space? Or are you going to need access to data when you are you know, at a conference or um, you know, working remotely? So those are questions that you want to quickly ask um, to understand more. Uh, step four would be knowing your technical requirements and needs. Again, coming back to our goal, what are the necessities and what are good to have? Here is not the full list. This is the potential questions you might be asking, right? Um, you want to see you know, whether your technical requirement you, all these technical requirements fit the best practices and should fit what you're looking for and your goal. We will share an electronic lab notebook cell evaluation spreadsheet for you in the, in the email. So you can use that spreadsheet to kind of figure out, um, you know, these kind of technical requirements and necessities. But it can be, you know, how you're accessing it, backup requirements, security needs, referencing, collaboration. If you have a regulatory requirement, uh, sometimes privacy requirements for your, your technical requirements. Are there other tools uh, that you need to help you kind of uh, with research management? That's another thing you can think about. Uh, who will maintain the technical infrastructure? Now, people always forget this, right? Because just because you can access a, a digital tool, you have to think about who is going to take care of it. Um, and also, if you are someone who is taking care of it, how if you run into trouble with this, you know, um, with, with uh, the software you're using, who is going to help you? Uh, also, if you have new people joining the team, what kind of training materials will you have access to, right? So those are the questions and technical requirements you want to think about. I want to mention one thing because that was a question brought up by one of the um, attendees uh, in the registration form. Every organization, like the, with, with regards to privacy needs, we see a lot of that in like more of a health research settings, hospital settings, uh, where there is a more stringent privacy needs. These privacy needs are usually defined by either the project, the institution, the organization, or maybe there is an additional uh, uh, regulatory requirements. These privacy needs should be discussed within your organization. Uh, it's really hard to be very specific about whether a tool uh, can fulfill certain privacy requirements, right? So it is very important for, for you to have that internal discussion. It could be the IT lead. Um, it could be someone who is in charge of privacy. Uh, there might be additional requirements like you know, the device usage and, and computer usage, and that's hardware usage. Uh, so those privacy requirements, please make sure to have a discussion within, excuse me, within your organization to define those. And then the next step can be to figure out whether your technical setup is you know, fulfilling those privacy needs or whether you need additional tools to help you. Then you will approach the tool provider and say, hey, here are a list of our requirements. Can you help support it? And then that's when you can have that discussion. 
The next step, be, step is you want to communicate the change in any procedural tech, uh, practices, like how people are saving files, how people are naming files. Make sure you communicate the change. Make sure people understand why. It doesn't. It shouldn't just be we're doing this this way and then that's it. You should make sure that everyone understand why. So involve lab members in that decision making and listen to feedback for uh, from those who handle data every day, right? Because they know what will slow them down or what will speed things up, and provide the context and background on why this is important. Regardless, like you know, it's important because we're applying for this and it requires this. If we don't get, if we don't do this, we're gonna lose our funding. It's important because we're doing a collaboration with this other group and if we don't do this, it's going to slow down the collaboration, make it really challenging. We're doing this because, you know, things like that, right? Want to make sure you provide the context and make sure that this is something that people understand, right? And then that way people have more motivation to actually work on it. Next step, step six. Okay, we're almost at the end. Uh, you want to start developing a plan toward your goal. Now that you have all the information, all the contacts, all the information, you know, all the requirements you need, go back to look at step one and four and develop an action items and set timeline. Decide your how, how you're going to transition, right? You can transition, you know, based on our experience, um, transition is the best to start a transition with what you're currently working on and what you will be working on in the future. Start with that because you can always work out what works and what doesn't work when you're actively working on it, right? Uh, and then if you have past data, then you will convert them, you know, in, into the, if you need them in, in a digital format. That's what we recommend. Also, you want to create templates that work so when you can, because that can improve your efficiency and that can make sure things are standardized, right? So you can follow, that will make sure you follow best practices as much as you can. Then you will decide who will be responsible for this. Is it going to be a student or postdoc? Right, keep in mind the turnover because some of them don't stay in the lab for an extended period of time. Also, do they have the authority to actually move things forward? If they say, hey, we think we should do it this way, can they actually help to push that move uh, forward? It, it, could it be a research associate or staff member or technician or things like that? Make sure to balance their existing workload, right? Because some of them already have a lot of projects on their hand create some motivation. Could it, it could be that, okay, we're going to give you some more time to work on this. It could be that, okay, there is a bonus for you, you know, if you help with this, right? Create some sort of motivation for, for them to help with this. If the PI is responsible, if the lead researcher is responsible, is this a priority for this person, right? Will the PI get too busy for it and then it just doesn't happen? Right. Um, so that's something also to keep in mind. Right. So you want to have someone responsible, but you also want to make sure this person has the ability to move things forward. Then uh, here are some examples of action items. So developing a naming sy uh, system for your files, how to name the files and document it. Create a template for documenting protocols. Decide what file structure will make the most sense. And again, document it. Those things need to be written down. If you don't write it down, if you don't, don't have that shareable with the other team members, they don't really mean a lot. You have to have this documented. Lastly, if you're thinking about purchasing or buying some sort of tool to help you, make sure to look at into getting a trial or a demo. This is highly recommended only because that's the best way to know whether something works for you and know all the possible features that will be available through the paid version. It will shorten your research time for sure uh, if you get, you know, have a chance to do a demo or trial. You want to ask about pricing, training materials, additional support available, and any added benefit. Last step. Review, improve, and maintain. You don't you don't expect overnight change because we have never seen that. It's it's not so much like a switch where we want to start managing data better digitally. Let's flip a switch and then just things magically happen. It takes time. It does take time. This kind of change does take time. So once in a while, you want to be able to review what's working, what's not working. If something isn't working, understand why so you can improve it. And this will help you maintain best practices in the long run because we're not looking for a short-term change. We're looking for maintaining data in the long run so that you can find data easier, so you can reuse data, so it has that kind of impact down the road. 
you want to have a plan for ongoing training, right? You want to have some training materials so that new lab members to join, you don't need to go through everything over again. Here is basically you want to go, here is a material, here's a training module, or here's something that you can quickly pick up what's you know, going on in the lab when it comes to data management. Again, keep your goal in mind and prioritize. Know what's necessary and what's good to have. And this is where I want to transition a little bit to comparing a few different ways of managing data. Um, I kind of, this is actually, this triangle is actually a project management triangle that I'm kind of borrowing for this purpose. Basically, the point is that the quality of your data management really depends on a few different factors, right? And here we have scope, the size of the project, the cost of the project, and the time that you have available or the timeline you have, right? And, um, and, and, Working with different ways of you know, managing data, you will see how this will shift, right? So uh, we have a resource on comparing different ways of managing data, and uh, that's also going to be in the email that you receive, uh, so you can take a look. First, working with paper. We all love working with paper, and it's easy to use, but it's extremely difficult to manage. And there are a few challenges, right? It's difficult to find access and reuse data and metadata, and we're talking about the FAIR principles. Uh, definitely very difficult with this. Uh, a lot of time and physical space really is wasted to manage this data that's like on paper. Uh, every time I think about paper storage, I think about this scene in Indiana Jones movie where you see this box that get pushed into this big warehouse and somehow this just kind of disappear, right? And it becomes extremely difficult um, to, to find. Uh, it's also very difficult when you have turnover, right? I, I, I want to share a story. When I was a, a undergraduate student, I, I, was a, I was doing a co-op job, and then uh, I, I was one of those students who would take the lab notebook home <laughs> because I want to work on it. So one day I took it home. Now, of course, that was not the best practice because if I took it home and something happened to a lab notebook, we basically lost that data, right? So I took it home, and then next day when I went to the lab, Apparently the lab next door got burned down, right? And my lab was also destroyed. Luckily I saved that data because I have my paper notebook with me. Um, and uh, so I was lucky in that way, but it also calls for the importance of making sure your data is updated, right? And making sure that you have data accessible. Because if you think about natural disaster and whatnot, if there is a fire and you have paper notebook stored in your lab, that's basically gone, right? You will not be able to find those data again. Uh, so that was my little story about data management that I, I want to share. That's uh, I got lucky, but you know, people are always not not always very lucky with uh, uh, having paper notes. So, so the action item here would be to switch to a digital system because that's the only way that will help you uh, to easily find assets and reuse data. Now, if you're working with, and I know a lot of you are working with a shared server folder. It's also very easy to use. You get you could lose control very quickly when you have multiple users using a shared server folder, because everyone likes to save files differently. Everyone wants to organize files differently, and then so it really depends on the individual to follow best practices. And they also lack interactive features for automation, tracking, and referencing. So you need to standardize your management procedure as much as you can. You need to create template for repeat tests as much as you can. I know some people also have access to OneNote because it sort of comes with you know, Microsoft and it's easy to access and to use. Microsoft OneNote is more or less like a paper notebook. So it has doesn't really have a hi great hierarchy. Uh, it lacks the structure, it's really the digital version. It does, it is digital though. So it does come with some of the benefits of digital, um, digital data management. But again, depends on individuals, depend, uh, depend on individual for the best practices. And Again, here comes to standardizing data management procedures as much as you can and create a template. You can kind of start to see that working with some of the tools, paper, uh, file folders, OneNote, you're leaning toward to spending more time to manage data. The cost is low though, because, you know, and the time, like the cost is a lot lower, the resource you need is a lot lower, but you're spending a lot of time in the management part. And we're looking now at you working with an electronic lab notebook. It does take longer to adopt because it's, again, a new tool. But you're looking at a longer, uh, longer adoption time, but it, it does could pay off in the long run because of the features are designed for research labs. So the challenges are it takes the time to integrate into your day-to-day -day research practice. 
And there are probably there's probably a cost associated with it, or if there are good features, sometimes you want to uh, sometimes those features are developed, and so sometimes you need to pay for those additional good features. It really depends on how much time you're getting you're saved saving though out of those features and that's important so make sure to sign up for a full trial demo to learn your options like i say to show them your research time treat it like an investment and what you want to do is to get the most out of that so you want to look at whether you provide additional benefits how much time you are saving and and an example i can give is that with our um users we've, we've did a kind of unofficial survey and they were talking about i think uh either seven or nine hours saved every week uh with using an electronic lab notebook. Think about the time that you'll get back. And then you want to work with a provi provider that will help you with implementation and training. And that's really important because you don't want to take much lo even longer to help to get things up and running. All right, so we've talked about a few different options. We're comparing the challenges you might face when it comes to using paper, using share file folders, using OneNote, and using electronic lab notebook now you probably have a lot of experiences with the first three options right because that's kind of uh, easily accessible the third the, the last one electronic lab notebook you 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 might be wondering well why is it like to be using an electronic lab notebook for data management and here is when i pass it to jack who is going to give us a, a little walk walkthrough of uh using an electronic lab notebook like sino the benefit you can be getting yeah. All happy. right, Jack, take over, please. <laughs> yep. I am happy to do so. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to walk us through a quick little overview of the different functionalities of Sino today so that you can get a feel for how some of these things Teresa is talking about uh, are executed within an electronic lab notebook format. So here we are within Sino. Um, Sino at its core is broken down into four main sections, those sections being projects, inventories, templates, and reports. When you first log in, I noticed a lot of you said things varying around project management, team management, just better organization in general. This overview tab is incredibly useful for that. So as you're going through and designing your projects, you're assigning tasks to different members. So everybody in your lab will sort of have this to-do list of current tasks as soon as they log in. You can think of this like a home page. So they can scroll through, see what's coming up for the next couple of weeks. We'll see what's overdue as well as what's due soon highlighted for us. And then you can visualize this even better with the calendar here. So every red dot on my calendar is telling me, okay, I need to do something that day. So you can imagine logging in on the 9th today, I click the day and I have two links to the experiments that I need to complete for today. Traceability was something else that we also emphasized today. And every single action we take within Sinote is going to be recorded with a date and a timestamp. So this is just one example of a window in Sinote where you're going to be able to keep track of exactly what happened, when it happened, and who did that action. Uh, so these are all links. So if I need to click one and just jump back into what I was doing the day before, I'm able to. Sort of the crux of Sinote in a way is the protocol templates. So when we're in Sinote, we have the ability to create an unlimited number of SOP templates here in the template section. So of course we will name our template. We can associate keywords with it to make searching for it uh, easier. And then basically the way Sinote works is the, the reason I call it the crux is because whenever you're in a project and it's time to execute a protocol, you can basically imagine this is a big bucket of your protocols and you're just pulling whichever one you need out of the bucket into the project. Well, another great thing Sinote does is it remembers every instance of that happening for us. So the number of linked tasks column is telling me in this instance that there's 91 iterations of this protocol's usage throughout my different projects in Sinote. So maybe I wanted to click that number 91 and have a list view of every single experiment where that happened. Maybe I want to compare and contrast the different iterations of that protocol, see the different notes and data that's been generated by the different members of my lab so that maybe we can make some sort of update to the SOP, SOP and improve it, all of which would still be tracked and traceable within the notebook. As far as actually building out an SOP, it's quite simple to do so. So this probably looks really familiar. It basically just looks like a piece of paper, right? So we name our protocol. We can have a description for it. And then like any other protocol, it's going to be built out with steps, right? So here we have step one. If I wanted to edit this step, I can simply click inside the box, type whatever I need. You see I have formatting options. 
We also have a lot of users that are using the stylus on a tablet or dictation to be able to uh, record their text. What's nice here is I can just click outside of this box and it saves whatever I've done. That's not the only option in a protocol step though. We have table, checklist, and file as other options for customizing our SOPs. So you can see a table here and a checklist here, pretty straightforward, but just really great for organizing and keeping things in the format we want them. And then we come upon a file attachment. So you can upload virtually any type of file into Synote, uh, but what's nice about certain files is that they'll be editable within the notebook itself. So in this instance, it is an image. Let's say I wanna edit this image within my notebook each time I execute the protocol. Well, I have the ability to do so. I just simply click edit in Synote. Maybe I need to circle some lanes or something or draw a smiley face for my friends. And then I can save this directly back in um, every time I pass through and execute this protocol. No need to re-upload this file in any capacity. Of course, we have a PDF and some other types of files, but another editable file within the protocol will be Microsoft. So I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, use Word and or Power uh, Excel when working in the lab. So what's nice about that is we're integrated with Microsoft Online. So let's say you add a Word document or Excel spreadsheet into your protocol. You'll be able to edit that within the notebook as well. So I've edited in Word for the web. I can open up that integration with Microsoft and now any changes I make to this document, let's say I just change this one to a zero, that's going to save it directly into my notebook entry. So no need to re-upload this file either. As you can see in the top left, it's currently saving it back into my notebook as we speak. So that's building out protocols. Um, we also can look at projects today. So projects is really where you're going to be spending a lot of your time when it comes to actually bench work or producing data, inputting results, and so on. So there's a three-layer uh, hierarchy in Synote for setting up our projects. Projects are the top layer, and each one of these cards is its own project. You can sort of think of them like folders on your desktop. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that idea. You just create a folder, and all of that project data lives in that folder. Well, that's not very dissimilar from Synote at all. So for this example, let's look at this project, Synode Experiment Templates. First thing I'd like you to notice is that we can set who that project is visible to. So it can be visible just to project members or to the entire team. And then as far as team management and organization, you're able to add different members and change their role to affect changes to the permissions if you need to limit what certain users can do within a project. From there, a project is broken up into experiments, which are essentially subfolders, or as we call them sometimes workflows. So if I click on an example of an experiment, here's an experiment comprised of eight boxes in a workflow. Each box now is called a task. So you design these workflows yourselves. This is very unique to sign up. The idea of sort of being able to visualize your workflow as a team, I can see what's in progress, what's completed, so I can quickly glean the status of my experiment. Designing these is really easy. So I can just drag and drop a new task onto the canvas. Let's say I need to do some analysis after this QPCR step. And then I can just add it into my workflow like so. So I can design these however I want. They can be a bunch of different branches out, really complicated, or it can just be three in series. That's up to the user. But what's nice is I can duplicate these as a template later if I need to. So as far as reusing work and you know, reiterating work, it's gonna be really easy to simply duplicate a workflow as a template and move it across different projects. And then we come into an actual task itself. So the task is really the notebook entry portion of Sino. So there's a due date when that's going to be due, that'll reflect back to my calendar I showed. We can tag the task if we wanna make it easier to search metadata assigned to certain tasks. Of course, it is a notebook, so we can take notes here. We have assigned inventory items. So basically, any inventory item I have, I can assign to this task, and then it's going to be able to recall that I use that item in this specific task. So let's say I wanted to use some solvents here. I select which solvents I want to use, click Assign to Task, and then sign out's going to always remember for me, you use these specific ID numbers in this specific task. And then we come to the protocol. So every task has a protocol associated with it. If you already have your template made, like we established, you should probably have those templates made within Synote. 
And then we click load from templates, select the protocol you want, click load, and it will populate into your task. What you've done at that point is in essence, created a new version of your protocol. So at the task level, let's say I need to input some data or make some sort of note. Maybe I need to say this didn't work as intended. So this won't change my template, but I'm given the latitude to say, I need to make a note here because as we all know, things don't always go exactly as we plan them. Otherwise we would go through and simply check off each protocol step as we go to notify to our team that it's been completed. And speaking of notifying our team, as you're collaborating with each other on a protocol, you're gonna be able to sort of message each other using the comment system. So if I use the at key, my entire team appears and I'm able to message somebody, let's say, Ellie, I need your help. So this would send a notification to Ellie that I need help on this specific task. And as you see here, some reference links, I can leave those for her as well as needed. So it really helps with collaboration. So that's mostly it on a task. Every task also has unique results and activity sections for recording results and keeping track of exactly what's taken place within a given task. We also come to inventory. So you have an unlimited number of inventories. Um, not much to say here for today, but other than that, just for recording how many samples you have, freezers, lab equipment, anything, you can customize each inventory, store those items within Synode, and then assign them where they need to go, um, and just keep continually keep track of exactly what's being used within the lab. And then the last main section of Synote is reporting. So at any time I can generate a PDF report, we can generate an unlimited number of them in Synote on anything I have stored in my projects. So you can see here, it's the experiment description, the protocol. I have an Excel spreadsheet with data in it that I can download separately. And I can download this entire report to back it up. I could send it to a collaborator, to a PI, whatever I need. And Synote really is just compiling this for me based on what I tell it that I need from the project to be collated into a, into a report. As you can see, images come out nicely. And again, this is sort of another customizable portion of Synode where you can even have your own label in the top left um, for a company or university. The last thing I would cover today would just be two little things. So you will be able to get notifications in Synode on this bell. Uh, so again, helping with collaboration and organization, it's good to be notified of things. Like Teresa said, if it's not right, written down or notified of somebody, it's uh, going to lose value quickly. And then the search bar. So let's say I wanted to search for something in this instance, let's search for HPLC. If you all forgive me, I'm from a chemistry background. So we search HPLC and it's going to sort of segment every section of Synote telling me where it got a hit on my word or phrase. So imagine being able to do this with a paper lab notebook, right? How powerful is this that we can just search for something and it tell us, I found two in tasks, five in protocols. And the coolest thing to me is that it can even search for the files we've uploaded into Synode as attachments. You'll see here that HPLC is not in the title of either of these files. It's actually in the body, but Synode's search function is still able to track that down for me. And maybe just one final note would be on support. So always embedded within Synode, you have video tutorials, support links, FAQ articles, and even courses you can take to help you and new users get up to speed on how to use the software. That's all just in addition to the fact that we also have a fully staffed customer success team that would help you and your team in the early stages of onboarding and implementing the software. But that is the main functionalities for today. I believe we're going to turn it over to a Q&A now for the last 15 minutes. I will stop sharing and we can get into that. Perfect. Thank you, Jack. That was a very great overview of, um, of Synode. And uh, can everyone see my screen, the Q&A screen? Yep. Perfect. Um, so we have a, sorry. <laughs> um, so we have a, we're going to start the Q&A. I do want to ask Laura. Laura has been helping out in the back end. Uh, in, that's the little Synode thing icon. Laura is uh, uh, posting a uh, webinar um, overview, sorry, webinar survey, uh, feedback survey in the chat box. Please, please find a chance to take like, it's just a few questions. Uh, take a chance to uh, answer some of the questions in there when you get a chance. And I want to put that there. You can 
do it at the end after the Q&A. I just want to put that there so that you know that the link to the um, survey is there. All right, so we have some questions uh, in the Q&A. I do want to start with some of the questions that we got through the registration form. I'm sorry that I don't have them written down anywhere. Uh, I, I do want to start with uh, one quick question, which is, uh, how do I comply with privacy laws or privacy requirement when it comes to managing data digitally? And as I mentioned really quickly inside um, the, the, um, the presentation, that make sure you talk, have an internal conversation and something that uh, is challenging for us to advise directly. But once you have that internal conversation, or if you're aware of the privacy requirement for it, then you can come, uh, you can see that there is a link to email Jack, um, um, you, you, sorry, Jack's email address on the QA slide, as well as the QR code for a link to meet with Jack. Uh, bring those needs and then uh, book a meeting with Jack and then chat with him about your specific requirements. And we can better, we can then better advise you when it comes to privacy requirement, because I know a lot of people will have that in more like a hospital and health sciences, uh, health research setting. So, so that's one of the questions we got. The other question we got, is how to validate software like an ELN or others when it comes to 21 CFR Part 11 to stay compliant. Uh, Jack, can you help with that question? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't quite have time today to show all of the features of SignUp, but with certain plans, you can be completely compliant to 21 CFR Part 11 via electronic signatures, audit trails, and the locking of information. So basically when I was in the task, there's the ability to move it through a series of steps with certain plans of sign out that locks that task. You request signatures of other members within your lab. They ultimately sign off on that task um, and it's sort of done and archived at that point as an FDA compliant task with an audit trail uh, saved directly to your sign out of all of that having taken place. Thank you, Jack. We are also answering some questions in the QAM box, so uh, mm -hmm. feel free to check that. Um, the next question I have from the registration form again is whether we will suggest using an all-in-one research data management platform or multiple tools distributed on different platforms. So that's a that's a in, an interesting question because we came across that before. Uh, we always believe like you should use the best tool for what works the best for you, and sometimes that means that you might have different tools uh, for very specific purpose, right? For example, um, you might use one specific type of software to analyze a specific type of data. So what you are looking for then is to use a platform as a hub, right? So for example, using Sino as a hub um, to connect to different things, right? So that it's easy to refer to. And because Sino is cloud-based and because you can insert links and references, and that makes it easy for Sino to serve as like a hub to connect to other things, other tools that serve the best for your needs. Um, when it comes to cost of that, uh, it, because the, the person also asked about the cost, that's something that, uh, again, uh, contact us because um, you know we'll work out a more customizable plan for you, a customized plan for you. So definitely talk to us directly. But yeah, so from our point of view, a lot of time we see people using Sino as a hub to kind of direct. Uh, you can also use it to store everything depending on your needs. So you really, really, really depending on your situation. And again, contact us and we can probably provide better advice on that perspective. All right, I have the next question is how do I handle a large data set or complicated data, Jack? Yeah, sure. So with large data, there are going to be limits for all electronic lab notebooks, not with just Synode. So at this time, Synode is around three to 500 megabytes for an attachment. If you have a larger data set, what most of our users are doing is using some sort of cloud storage solution and then simply creating a hyperlink to that data in the exact section or notebook entry where you need it. So it's still correlated directly to Synode. You can imagine it being in the exact result field or, or protocol step field where you need it. It's just not exactly previewable, but it's still correlated with Synod and able to be viewed by your team as a hyperlink uh, within the notebook. So it's like the same idea, right? Having Sino as a hub really to exactly. kind of make the references to different sources. I also want to mention two other things, actually, um, since we're talking about large data set. Uh, one, 
one thing is that this is also where it's very important to have a workflow or a template, like some sort of plan or procedure in place when it comes to managing a large number of uh, large data set or even a, a large number of images, for example. You want to be very clear about how you're naming things, how you're structuring files and whatnot. So that's that's kind of important when it comes to large data set. The second thing I want to mention, it's not related to data set, but I don't remember if we mentioned it. Jack, did we mention that our app is coming out? Not at this time, no, but it is under development for this year. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So we are working on a Sino app that will allow you to bring your uh, protocol and your um, you know, protocol to the bench so you can follow along at the bench. Uh, the, the mobile app will also uh, allow you to upload results directly through your phone or mobile devices. That's coming out, I believe, actually in a month or two. I hope the product team doesn't hate me for saying this, but I believe that it, uh, the app will be coming out fairly soon. Uh, so uh, definitely look out for that. Anyways, we are answering some questions. We, we still have some questions in the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jack, is there any questions that you want to answer at the moment on, on live directly? I know that you're yeah. typing some answers uh, directly mm -hmm. in the Q&A already. Yeah, we, we got a lot of good questions in. So maybe I'll just do a quick overview of some of them. Um, so if you change a document or file, does it have version control? So this is something I sort of touched on a little bit with protocols. Each protocol essentially becomes its own version when you make it into a task. So at that time, if data changes, if notes need to change, you can always go back and look at those different iterations of that protocol. Can we preview edit PDFs and search them? Yes, PDFs are able to be viewed and searched within Sino. Even the bodies of the PDFs, like I showed at the final stage of my demo, uh, will come up in a search. What image formats are supported? So I know that there's some special sort of images that you're also asking about in your next question. I'm gonna have to check on that specific type of image. In general, any type of file is going to be uploaded into Sino so long as it is 300 megabytes or less. Is there a function to automatically transfer data from one module to an uploaded Excel spreadsheet? Is there a data analysis module? So at this time, Synote is more purely an elect electronic lab notebook. It is not a data analysis tool, maybe in the future in some years, but at this time, it's not something that's available. But Synote does have open API. So with that API, you can potentially set up the ability to have data automatically put into your notebook entries from equipment or other software that you're using. I see there's also a question about including signatures. Um, so a little bit, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a complete clarity here, but from what I understand, you mean including signatures in each step of a protocol. You can on the reports include signatures, but if you need specific steps of a protocol to be signed off on, you would need to make those into their own tasks in order to sign off on them. And then we have some few other live questions that I haven't gotten to yet, Teresa, would you like me to go ahead and jump into those? Sure, please go ahead. Uh, I just want to save uh, maybe one or two minutes at the end. We have another wonderful activity that I really want to do. Uh, but also okay. a reminder that please, everyone, take a few minutes uh, before you leave this webinar to complete, um, complete the, the survey. Absolutely, yeah. So I'll, they're, they're kind of uh, tapering off, I think, the question, so we should have time for that activity. Um, so do you have a table that shows the pluses and minuses and features between Synote and other competing ELN services? So at this time, not necessarily with other competing ELNs. I do think we have some tables for comparing Synote with OneNote and Paper. Um, if you are going to take on a full evaluation of ELNs, I would highly recommend getting in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk with you offline on a separate call, just sort of about how Sino compares more granularly with other software. Our multi-page 16-bit, so this is something that I had just touched on. So I'm not familiar with 16-bit TIFFs. I would have to look into that and let you know. Um, Alex, I think we've been emailing a good bit, so I'll be happy to get in touch with you about that. And can embedded metadata be searched for within image files? So if that image file had a text addition to it, that should be searchable. Um, different from if you just sort of drew in it or, or it was more a part of the file originally, that would not be searchable. And your last question is, can we create a file folder structure within Sino? So only in essence, you can do so using the project experiment and task structure, the hierarchy that we talked about today. So that could sort of be your um, quasi folder structure within Sino. You'd be able to create the project experiment and task as you see fit uh, to design around your specific projects and how that file folder structure needs to look. 
Um, and it's pretty customizable to do so. That's another thing that we could cover on a demo on a, on a separate call. I'd be happy to do so. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Jack. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are going to wrap it. We are wrapping up this webinar, and I have one last activity that I would like to finish it. The same thing as the waterfall activity, like I mentioned, for people who have been done it, type your answer in the of the question in the chat box, but do not press enter. Uh, make sure that I said to send messages to everyone, and when we have all the answer typing, we will all hit submit at the same time. Okay, so are we ready for the question? The question is. What is your next step for digital data management? What are you going to start doing differently? Or what are you going to do right after this webinar? Or maybe the next week? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Um, very interesting hearing that. We're going to do like a few more. Everyone typing things in. A little bit of time. All right. Are you ready? All right. Three, two, one, enter. Let's see what people are doing. All right, checking to the software. Excellent, checking the software. Be fair, very nice. And develop and improve the best practice documents. And then being discussing what a data management plan could look like and how Sino could be implemented. Excellent. All right, so I think that's all we have today. Uh, I want to thank every one of you for participating, attending um, from all over the world. I really appreciate that. Please, again, take a few minutes to finish the survey uh, so that we can get the feedback and so you can suggest actually future webinar topic topics inside a survey. All right, perfect. Thank you, everyone. We're going to um, take off now. We're good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.